Yeah, uh, when the call came to, you know, suggest uh, the possibility to, to address one of the topics that, uh, that were going to be uh, part of this uh, symposium, um, I thought, okay, this is something that I want to uh, say something about. So I think I responded uh, fairly quickly to Michael. And, uh, <laughs> but then once I had to actually start thinking about what I wanted to say, it became more and more difficult. Uh, because um, the question that is uh, raised in the title uh, includes an assumption, which is that electronic music is a genre. Um, and what then are the other genres into which electronic music should have uh, subsumed into or not? And so that, that, made, it, uh, that made it difficult. Um, I remember being in a FNAC uh, store, in this is still, it's basically the French uh, Saturn, in, uh, in Paris once, it's probably more than uh, 15 years ago, where I indeed saw that there was uh, a section for the electronic music genre in the CD and vinyl uh, department. Uh, and I was quite disappointed when I found out that there were no CDs with electronic music as I understood it at all. Uh, it was basically a section for techno and electronic uh, dance music. Um, I also recall attending a vinyl collector's fair in Germany where Stockhausen records were filed under Krautrock. <laughs> <laughs> so at least here, electronic music had been subsumed into another genre. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really. It was so it was Klaus Schulze and Stockhausen all together in one. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of crowd work doesn't either. <laughs> um, but I guess the, that the question raised here is more about those other names for genres that we hear around us in our field of interest, such as acousmatic music, electroacoustic music, and, uh, and sound art. It is interesting to mention that in a recent panel discussion about acousmatic music today, uh, it was at the Degem uh, anniversary event in Karlsruhe just uh, two weeks ago, um, there was, so there was this talk, this panel discussion, uh, but it was very difficult uh, by the people who participated in the panel to agree on what acousmatic music is. Uh, and these were Daniel Teruji, uh, Annette van der Gorne, Volkmar Hein, uh, uh, Elena Ungerhoyer, uh, and they, 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 had a, they had really a hard time to, to, to try and define what they were supposed to be talking about together. Um, for instance, uh, should the recognizability of the sounds be avoided or should it be emphasized? Um, should there be archetypal sounds as to be able to follow the narrative? Role, which role does sound projection play? All these things, uh, I mean, there are very, very different opinions about those. All, all interesting. Um, now, I am not particularly keen on the genre-based identification of music in the first place. Um, but let us assume that indeed electronic music was a genre. Um, particularly in Germany where the term elektronische Musik was introduced uh, at the beginning of the 1950s. And let us then also assume as well that French musique concrète was or still is another genre. And to, to find out if these genres have subsumed, we need to ask ourselves first what the characteristics of these genres are. And, um, this might be a bit of an obvious and unnecessary thing for an audience like this, but I would like to use the opportunity to address some persistent misunderstandings as I see them. And this might then also be helpful to answer the question in the title of this panel discussion. So, the technical reality in the 1950s made it necessary in the Cologne studio for electronic music to apply working methods that showed similarities with the Studio for Musique Concrète in Paris. However, their aesthetic and theoretical starting points were completely different. Reducing these differences now to the use of purely electronic sound material in Cologne on the one hand and the use of material based on microphone recordings in Paris on the other is something I find naive and misleading. So I hope this is already something that we can uh, discuss further. <laughs> I have discussed this matter, by the way, extensively with Gottfried Michael Koenig, uh, but also with Daniel Terugi and Christian uh, Zanesi. 
I was reminded of these discussions just recently in the previous mentioned discussion about acousmatic music today, where Teruji said literally that he couldn't stand it when people talk about concrete sounds. For me, concrete music, as Pierre Schaeffer describes it, is music that is composed by working with and listening to sound directly, instead of composing a score based on a symbolic notation first, which then only becomes audible when the music is performed or not at all. This made it necessary to develop the technique of reduced listening and solfege for sound objects. Well, I guess you are all uh, familiar with those things. And Schaeffer criticized the electronic music that was made in Cologne because um, he saw this possibility of the technology recording sounds uh, and uh, using them to make concrete music, so music without symbolic notation, uh, whereas in Cologne he saw people making scores. I think it's a subject that was addressed briefly in the previous discussion that is also going to be discussed uh, later. Uh, so the necessity or, the, or the, the, the reason for the existence of scores in electronic music. Um, so this is something that he found uh, uh, wrong, to, to make scores and then realize the music based on scores instead of working with the sound material directly. The composers in Cologne didn't want to compose with sounds, but they wanted to compose the sounds themselves, to apply compositional rules to the construction of sound. And this idea was a consequence of serial compositional thinking, which led to the use of sine waves, filtered noise, and filtered impulses. It's uh, interesting to uh, mention this, uh, maybe not that all of you know this, that actually in, the, uh, uh, in those years, in the early 1950s, in the Darmstadt uh, uh, summer course of, uh, of music, uh, Musique Concrète was much more prominent than the electronic music from, uh, from Cologne. There were concerts uh, given by Pierre Giffer and Pierre Henry, whereas uh, the people from Cologne only were there to give a couple of talks with uh, sound examples. So, um, so now I would like to have another look at Schaeffer's term sound object, also in relation to electronic music. So, according to me, uh, a sine wave is not a sound object, but a sound ingredient. A sound object has a specific duration, the tone from an oscillator doesn't. Once a tone from an oscillator has been recorded on tape and cut to a specific duration, it can become a sound object, just like a sound recorder with a microphone can become a sound object. The duration of a sound object must lie within reasonable range that is determined by human perception. So a one-hour recording of a nightly cricket crier is not a sound object for me. But a 10-second excerpt of the above-mentioned recording is a sound object. For practical reasons, one would work with sound material cut to specific durations in the early Cologne Studio 2. Cutting, splicing, and mixing tape segments were the only ways in which one could create sound complexes and longer sequences. However, such a sound complex or sequence is not a concrete object, but a configuration. Whereas a sound object derives its possibly new meaning from the recorded sound source and its transformation, an electronic sound complex or sequence derives its meaning from an abstract, maybe serial organization, even when this configuration lies on the table in the form of a piece of magnetic tape of a certain length. According to me, the attention of serial organization is essentially oriented towards the continuum, towards the sound variation over time in which the perception of individual objects is not a necessity. The attention of musique concrète is essentially oriented towards the meaning of the individual sound objects and the narrative that might emerge from their connections. The organization of serial electronic musique is outside time, meaning that structural relationships are embedded in the parametrical design already before the music is represented on a timeline, and these relationships do not depend on a specific order of the material. The organization of musique concrète is inside time, meaning that its structural relationships only occur once the material is placed on the timeline in a specific order. Electronische musique aims at the abolition of the differentiation between large form and material. 
a presumably unintentional effect of Musique Concrete's focus on sound objects is that the differentiation between large form and material is emphasized. In Musique Concrete, silences separate sound objects. In electronic music, silences can operate as elements of a sound continuum. When Musique Concrete is spatialized, this is done to emphasize the individual characteristics of the sound objects. In electronic music, space is a parameter of the sound continuum. When in electronic music, the spatial distributions or movements of the sound material are not part of the compositional design, then they disturb the sound continuum instead of being a part of it. Stockhausen's Gesang de Jüdinger has nothing to do with Musique Concrète, despite the fact that it makes use of recordings of a boy's voice. The voice sounds are not sound objects, but are part of the composition's serially designed continuum. Schaeffer and his colleagues used the sounds of synthesizers in the 1970s as sound objects, which has nothing to do with the theoretical starting points of electronic music. Nowadays, sounds can be analyzed in such detail that the resulting individual components are similar to synthesized waveforms. At the same time, computer sound synthesis can now convincingly imitate sounds from acoustic instruments, for instance, with physical models. And it's also interesting to see that performed sound projection and spatial composition methods are meeting somewhere in the middle. For instance, multi-channel pieces with pre-composed sound distributions and trajectories are often presented on GRM's Acousmonium, and computer-based sound spatialization technologies such as wave field synthesis are offering more and more possibilities for live electronic music. So there are all these kinds of connections um, uh, appearing. But what I find very important is that technology is available today to anyone and not only at institutions that could dictate styles or genres as they have been doing in the past. So it's a, a big liberation, I would say. And did other genres maybe subsume into electronic music? So that's a variant of the, of the original question. Um, it was uh, quite funny to see uh, that, uh, that Dirk uh, Wright presented this uh, short Dutch video clip uh, of De Graaimakers. Uh, uh, it was a video clip that I'm very familiar with. I knew De Graaimakers really well. Uh, and this video clip is uh, from 1959, January 1959 to be precise. It was shot in the studio for electronic music of the Philips Research Laboratories in Eindhoven. Uh, and it was made while Reimakers and his uh, colleague Tom Disseveld, the, the smoking uh, character in the, in the film, um, were making popular electronic music. Yeah. Uh, the, these tracks are, are widely available and they're, they're really fantastic. But uh, So you see that already in the 50s, popular electronic music subsumed into electronic music in the, in the same kind of environment, maybe not here in Cologne, but, uh, but certainly in the Netherlands and also in, uh, in other parts of the world. Um, it also has become quite common to have concert programs in which electronic music compositions are combined with instrumental music, works in the field of sound art, improvised music with acoustic instruments and live electronics together, etc. So, to come back to the original question, I would say let's forget about genres and let's try to define what the music is that we are passionate about and what has it in common. And the following quote is very close to what I personally try to achieve. Music is no longer primarily conceived as a guide for premeditated emotions, but as the density of the possible relationships which first become actuality during production, and which during performance are presented to the listeners as material on which they must test their cap cap sorry, capability of relating to one another sounds beyond any environmental associations independent of bodily actions required to produce sounds, to relate them to one another and to articulate these relationships as musical language. I was surprised when this discussion was taking place about what is acousmatic music today that this description for me relates to a certain extent also to the idea of acousmatic music. But it is from Gottfried Michael König and it was uh, something that he wrote 
uh, about his uh, electronic compositions functionen in the analytical descriptions in the summary observations for, on compositional theory in 1971. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, what does it mean for something to exist? Uh, you could say that. <laughs> you <laughs> I mean, it existed three hours ago when we were in that concert hall. So uh, I guess uh, it exists as long as people are making it. Uh, and, and I see, so, but then, so for me, this is why, why I, I, I thought, okay, if I want to say what electronic music is, I have to, you know, relate it to something else, because otherwise it just, you, you're, you're talking in some kind of vacuum. So this is why I thought, okay, the obvious thing to relate it to is this other genre. Uh, so these were the two classical genres uh, that, that, that started at the end of the 40s, uh, beginning of the, of the 1950s. And um, so, when you say electronic music, I, for me, that is, rings the bell of electronic music. So of the electronic music as it was, uh, so it was also interesting to hear, to hear Herbert Eimert. Uh, so it, it is this, what, what was defined, what was started there. And the, and the essence of that was, of course, the idea to, you know, compose sound instead of just using it as, as objects, to, to let form emerge from the way that you uh, synthesize sound. In, in whatever way you do that. And it was already, at the end of the 50s, that Koenig saw the necessity for computers. For the, uh, the, you see in, in, in his piece essay from 57, you already see uh, a tendency to, to, to enter the domain of microsound, uh, which is uh, something that now uh, astonishes people like Horacio Fagione and so on, that they, they suddenly realized that this is something that was, was already formulated then. Maybe not so consciously as, uh, as we are talking about it now, but, but the, 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 the ideas were there. Um, yeah, so I would say that uh, unfortunately, I mean, uh, yeah, subsumed, uh, I would say even if, if the people who nowadays claim in, in the world of more popular trends uh, that they are inspired by and that they are using similar technologies as composers of electronic music uh, and, uh, and musique concrète, um, so this was basically my, 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 my idea of this, that, that, that I thought let's not only look at the technology that was used to make that music, but really try to um, revive the, the, the ideas that were behind the, the way that this music was made, because I, for me they are still incredibly inspiring. And I think as long as there are people inspired by those ideas, then this music will be, uh, will be there. Yeah, and I think it's interesting that Hans puts his hand up now, I was just about to say, and that relates back to Hans's discussion 
and and you know when talking about oh program or record, and mm. the response was yeah let's let's concentrate. Yeah, unfortunately, I was having my sound check because yeah, I would have yeah. been interested in it to hear what what Hans was saying. Yeah. The point that yeah. Hans made earlier, the, the concentration on sound as a starting point is is still apparent it's important. But yeah. The question of comment. Yeah, I have a rather long comment. I'm sorry. Um, Thank you very much for this kind of Wittgenstein definition block. <laughs> um, we can ask ourselves, when are definitions relevant? And you can look into any art manifest of it is Romori or Expressionists or Cubists or anything that at some point they decide this is what we want to do. Mm -hmm. And then do it, they do it for one year. And then obviously, life progresses and diverges. I've been in discussions with Tim Rucci and Christian Sané and all of those guys 20 years ago trying to define whether is music concrete or not. Hmm. Um, those definitions are not useful. No. They're not useful for us. They might be useful for someone who reflects back, but creative people normally, they also reflect forward. And what I think is a real change in our entire society is that the position of the composer, as we understand it, is not the same anymore like in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Earlier today, saying this shared ground, where it's not the privilege of one composer writing for an orchestra and being performed in city hall, but everybody can contribute. Mm -hmm. Because everybody can contribute, the role of the composer and this role of saying, come from this historic canon and I need to contribute this one word to it and hopefully be kind of remembered 200 years from now, that's not at their mind anymore. They make music with the technology which is at their hand and whether someone called it music complete or something else, no, 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 I totally agree, Hans. But uh, this is also why I was very precise in saying that uh, when I made this, this list with bullet points, according to me, yeah, so not uh, imposing this as a standard to anyone else, because I would, you know, we are both in education, and I would never say to a student, this is what it has to be, you know, uh, uh, never. Uh, 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 something important here, and um, it's maybe not related to. Um, micro definitions of what electronic music might be, mm -hmm. but maybe the aspect of listening, which is encouraged by being presented with works of electronic music. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something that's, that's a part of the definition of this genre to the extent that it exists at all. Mm -hmm. When you're presented with electronic music, you're often presented with something which is perhaps quite difficult to listen to and mm -hmm. demands a level of attention which other sonic arts maybe don't demand mm -hmm. by engaging with these electronic art forms, especially in the absence of any kind of recognizable and visually present instrument, actually take you somewhere that other forms of music, other experiences in life can't take you, that they offer unique insights into what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, I also said in the end that, you know, I, I think that we should forget about those genres. Yeah? So it's, it's, uh, and, and indeed, the, the point is, of course, that, uh, you know, I think, uh, who mentioned this? I think it was Dirk that, uh, that uh, Herbert Eimert was very, uh, you know, strict in who he would allow into the studio and who not. Uh, and the same was, of course, true for Schaeffer. I mean, there were, if you, you, you think of somebody like Janis Xenakis, how he had to fight to get into that group. Um, uh, and, and that is, of course, the, 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 uh, and this is also how these styles could be, and, and these genres could be emphasized, the importance of them could be emphasized so much, because if you wouldn't um, uh, make a contribution to, to that genre, then you wouldn't get into the studio. Uh, and now, with the technology being available uh, to everyone, th this, is, this is a completely different situation, and then it's something that we should be, be very happy about, of course. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just very curious to know the, the feeling of the students. And I hope that your answer will not be listening to your professor. But uh, I want to connect to the um, Hans comment. Because for me, what Hans was saying is pretty much connected to the role of history so, and, and the role of the past. How much is important? How much is important to refer to? not as a rule, but as a point of reflection, friction, of interaction with what was in the past. So of course for me, for my generation, it was very important to have those milestones 
in mind. But now the question is uh, how it's important for you, how do you feel about it, and how it is important in your daily practice of So I am honestly curious. I think one of the things that I that I tried to explain was that the the the, the technology that the, the studio in Paris and the studio in Cologne had was not that different. You know? So, uh, but but obviously the, the 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 genres, if you want to call it like that, were extremely different. It was a choice, yeah. But but it was a choice that was not uh, 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 dictated by the available technology. This is what I'm what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I want to be sure to understand correctly. So you are saying that when you are composing, so for you is something that is in, in relation to the tools that you have, and so you see those two genres as a, uh, the expression of the tools that they have, and not as the principles, the idea, the relationship they, that they had with composing. I mean, there is an aesthetic that produces probably some tools instead of other some tools, and then the aesthetic is just the consequence of the tools that they have. Because there is a different approach to it. It's very difficult. I would say that some types of like aesthetics I wouldn't think of if I didn't have the tools. So I think it's a really closely connected because. Can compose without those tools, but that would then also mean that I wouldn't be able to think about a kind of aesthetic. So mm -hmm. it's really not, I guess. <laughs> and there's like no, I think, the answer to that for me. But there are things that you recognize when you hear them. Uh, so, uh, and of course, you need some kind of historical awareness uh, for that. But just to give you a, uh, an example from, from a few hours ago, after the concert, Dirk Wright came to me and he said, yes, that was really sonology music. <laughs> so <laughs> apparently there was something that he recognized, something that he, he, he identified as coming from a tradition or a specific uh, studio or a specific, uh, you know, aesthetic approach. Uh, and, 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 and of course we have that, you know, if you, if you go to an Akismodium concert uh, at DRM in Paris, you, you, well, even if those pieces are, can be very different, but there is something very specific about it. And uh, we don't need to, we don't need bullet points to, to, to describe that, but this was, you know, part of my, my uh, assignment, so to speak, in this, to, to, to try and, and emphasize something. So this I, I find this question extremely interesting. I think there's such a thing like a productive misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. You can spend on that. Just uh, what you see on the surface, and this bring, may bring you as a composer, as an artist, to new things. Mm -hmm. Not to, to start from the aesthetics. This can be a good thing, this can be a bad thing. Mm -hmm. You can develop a mentality like in the supermarket, you just grab what you feel uh, is okay, but I think the result will show uh, uh, what you can is able to do. But I find it's very interesting today to, to see, okay, it, it goes also together with this question. We have such an overwhelming world of sounds and concepts and things, how can I uh, afford uh, not only to listen to it, but also to understand why it became this kind of flower of acoustic uh, concept and, and mm -hmm. so I think it's the rest of the question. Okay, so you, you mentioned um, 
in your sort of opposition of electronic music and music from Kreps, this distinction between composing with sounds and composing sound. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned that, I wondered myself, I doubt you're going to bite here, but I, <laughs> I, I wondered myself if the idea of composing sounds and maybe no longer distinguishing so much between composing sound and composing with sound is actually an aspect of electronic music which is still very important to this day and which is something that actually does set it apart from other types of music. Apart from perhaps music kind of concrete and that's mm. a whole different area, but it, it has similarities there. Well, I'm quite sure that many composers who are in this area, or let's say in the, who, who compose who work in, the, in this more French tradition, will say that they compose sounds too. Yeah. Um, I'm only saying that I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to make this distinction uh, exactly because of the term sound object. Yeah, because that, let's say you are, you, I mean, you you probably all have uh, had that experience. Uh, you go to a, to a music uh, a store where they buy uh, musical equipment, and somebody sits beside be, behind the synthesizer, and he just presses the same key all over and again, and he, and he tries the different sounds. Yeah, and this is what what seems to me for me is is against this idea of, um, well. There is this beautiful, um, I, I can't uh, uh, give you the quote now uh, exactly, but I can paraphrase more or less something that, that, that Koenig uh, wrote somewhere where he said that in electronic music, the, um, um, there you have a polyphony of timbres, uh, a polyphony of parameters that merge into timbre. Yeah? And this timbre is not uh, a static thing, but it is something that is in a constant state of variation. So it is like like you know like washing a river. You 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 know that that it is that it consists out of uh, uh, water drops, but the way that it um, um, appears to you is is in this constant state of of, of flux. And uh, so this this whole idea of identifying individual events in a, in a flow of, uh, of 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 sound is something that I, that I see as a result of this, uh, let's say, parametrical approach of the electronic music in, in Germany. Or indeed a result of, of the development of notation by itself. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, and the notation, of course, in, in, in the early days of electronic mu music, of electronic music was just a necessity, because uh, that's something that many people forget, but uh, the pieces were often not produced by the composers. Yeah? The composers had to give something to a technician in order to make a realization. And this technician would make an interpretation of this score, a transformation of the notation into uh, something that could be technically realized, and that was then the, uh, the piece. And, and I'm not so sure, but I guess that many of the graphical representations of those pieces were also made just to show to other people that it was actually a lot of work. <laughs> so to just to prove that it was music in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because I mean I know for a fact that uh, that there were a lot of people who were extremely disappointed when they start when they heard the first results from this electronic music studio in Cologne because they were all thinking that now we would have this you know very impressive and rich world of new sounds but that was not what it was about you know they, in order to try out what they what they, what they had in mind they needed to go back to an extremely limited uh, uh, type of sound material. I mean, I feel a bit s sorry to speak on behalf of German electronic music, but uh, since I am not German, but. <laughs> it's great to have an outside opinion of these things, especially from someone who's got experience from very close to both France and Germany. Mm. It's, it's often very important to hear of people's views and not just those of the compatriots. Mm. I'm not seeing any more hands, so I'm going to. Yeah, that's one. Yeah, sorry, but maybe just one, one, one idea that, that uh, came to my mind uh, talking about uh, the timbre and, uh, and the, um, the orientation of uh, the listener's orientation towards timbre. I mean, one connecting point I would see between music and electronic music is of course of, or is it, <laughs> uh, getting rid of instruments? And of the idea of identifying like the, the instrumental uh, order of timbre 
is a, is a very strong uh, system of ordering uh, sound or, or, or structuring music or structuring listening. And, uh, and both approaches, I think, um, had this idea or had, uh, yeah, to some extent, probably some success in moving away from that um, basic uh, structuring um, concept. Mm -hmm. or would, would you agree? I don't know. I mean, I know many examples of uh, uh, musique concrète uh, pieces where uh, sounds are uh, easily recognizable as coming from traditional musical instruments. So, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Something so. Yeah, but also still, I mean, uh, there was a there was a new uh, piece by Annette van der Gorn at uh, Degem concert uh, in, in Karlsruhe a few weeks ago, where and it just started with a choir singing. You know, so you just uh, untransformed. It was just there. But is that aspect which Florian mentioned something of importance to the people in the room? I don't know if speaking a lot, but in this, that's good. But in this room, there are other students of electronic composition I, I'd really like to hear from on this topic because we're interested in your view of what electronic music is for you and where it's going to go. Is, for instance, the absence of traditional acoustic instruments somehow a thumb mark, a thumbprint of um, electronic music. Is that something you find important? Or is electronic music now really so different to how it was defined by the technology of the 1950s and 60s to the extent that it really doesn't exist in that form at all and whether the music is from an electronic source or from an instrumental source doesn't really matter, it's all just composition. Go on, be brave. Before I pick one, sir. That's too true, I do that in class, I won't do that either. Go on, please. Maybe it's a bit controversial, but now that I think about it, I think by the time we were like, in the technology, we all did. I think there would have been some kind of before to be able to do this, and a kind of will to only use that to produce something. It doesn't mean that it is like uh, purely quality that they produce. And now that we have played all the themes and it's already been done in history, I think we're like reversing back, and it doesn't really matter to us what like we only can use. So uh, I'm definitely on the side that in electronic music we can use instruments. Like I propose you were instruments and then like in my pieces. So um, I think we're kind of taking a step back to see the whole picture rather than in the time where uh, electronic was established, whether I think we're really focused on explore, exploring the new techniques they have. Maya. Yeah. Commonly used among uh, people who are not musicians or artists is uh, experimental electronic music for, uh, for at least what I do when I perform. I perform with live electronics and I, if I'm about to tell uh, to someone who has no background in art, what, what are you doing? And then, and then I say, I play experimental electronic music. Aha! <laughs> <You know? laughs> Whatever they put into that, that is established. And that includes instruments and gear and playing. <laughs> just, just, so I was in the United States and somebody asked me, so not, not in a beautiful conference, what are you doing? And they tried music. Aha! And then Pink Floyd. Experimental. Experimental like And then I said, experimental. It's not Pink Floyd. So there was a, I think that it's pretty much based on the context and it's uh, fortunate and unfortunate. And that's why I think it is very interesting the, the perspective that we are kind of uh, focusing on a specific moment in the history and the, the connection with the roots or what we perceive as roots and maybe are not anymore. Yeah, because I, I sense that for the students is not is not even in questions anymore. Mm. It's not it's not a question. It's not something that is 
This is also this. This really relates to the reason for me to try and define these two uh, genres. I mean, not for, uh, I mean, I think I was clear about it, but just to repeat myself, not to uh, you know make one more important or, or better than the other, or to say this is how you should do it. Choose between these two options. So I mean, not 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 at all. That I'm only saying that since the focus when people look at history is so much about the equipment that was used. I think it is at least as interesting, uh, and maybe much more interesting even, to look at what the uh, composers uh, who were working in the, at that time were inspired by, what, what their ideas were, why they were using this technology, how they were using technology, how did the technology connect to you know, very strong ideas about form, about music, about, uh, uh, I mean, just only the fact that this music, both in Paris and Cologne, was made originally to be played on the radio. And that very soon after that music was there, they started to present it in a concert hall. What did that mean? What, what were the consequences of, 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 of that step? You know, you, you can, and, and then you, can, you have a totally different perspective on the, let's say, uh, French tradition of acousmonium, of, of uh, performing this music live, the ideas of, 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 sounds, uh, of composed uh, sound specialization, uh, as, as it was uh, developed already in the 50s by Stockhausen and by Koenig and by others. I mean, that is such a rich world of ideas. And, 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 and uh, so this is basically what I w want to say. If you were interested in this historical dimension of equipment, don't forget what was behind it. And that this is... Uh, yeah. Oh wow, this was, was, was happening. Yeah. And I tried to, you know, with all this knowledge, yeah. try to, to rebuild it in a way. But, so 
sorry, it was a too, too long introduction. No, 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 but I... Uh, and I was totally amazed when I, when, I, when, I see the, when I listen to the concerts here also that um, I think the most important thing about all that, I mean, I'm working with generative art now for the last three decades, and, and I was programming my stuff, and I was doing stuff with very, very expensive machines, and now, as, as it is accessible, I can work with a student with it, and, um, and bringing it back to the physical, to, to the physical world, hmm. that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah. Even if you see a new art installation out there, it's a tool to work on stage, mm -hmm. a tool to, to improvise on stage with musicians, dancers, and visual people. And I think this bringing it back to the, to the physical world, then there's maybe a totally different view of obsolescence. Because then you can integrate it in, in, in the physical world where we are like the most important. And when I'm there in this room, and the first time I hear you. Your, your music, you know, in a way I have to hear it because I can't hear it like that like at home, you know, it's not possible. But first time I can, it's a totally different kind of perception. I think this is, this is wonderful. We really like open the space for this kind of experiences in, in every way, you know, not only in a musical way, but now it's the possibility to also like the mind. And that's the key though, yeah. that you're opening a space for perception. Yeah, right. uh, you're not consuming something. You're not doing something else while you're listening. You're actually going in somewhere uh, for space, wholly dedicated to the perception of sound and sound structures. Uh, that, that's, that's a really important step. Mm -hmm. Tom, you have to force Yeah, force that <laughs> I just want to reply to the question of the initial point that it's going to be just music making. But to some extent, to some extent, yes, because the technology is similar that has been written, which is even more similar now, it's just a laptop and it's in basically, and hopefully it's in the bottom. <laughs> but um, uh, what's still maybe different is the mindset. It's also what you, uh, what you describe as, as uh, bringing, bringing to work in this sound and composing this sound. And composing the sound that has no, uh, uh, as, as much more, as much more behind it. But I think those mindsets still exist, but they are not ideologized that much as they have been, because it's now quite easy technology, easy, but also uh, but also conceptually easy to switch those mindsets. Hmm. As a, as a composer, you can, you can easily uh, try to compose the sound and then use it as the sound object and compose with hmm. the sound and you maybe do it, you switch it on that, at least in the idol, you switch it with the musical during the, during the production of the same piece. Mm -hmm. I get that once in a while. So those, uh, uh, those to, to know about those notions historically, they would be very well informed where the words all came from. Uh, for me, it used to be to the uh, to the insight that this kind of merged into um, yeah, maybe just music making, that's what that is. And a big uh, part of it, and then back to technology, is the the um, uh, is the fact that it's all just numbers. I mean, it's just it's just, it's just a bunch of numbers on in, uh, in, in some computer, and you can just do anything. With it. Uh, with those numbers, and that makes it easy to switch the mindset. You don't have to, to move from one studio to another to change your mindset. I mean, because you are allowed to do things in Paris which you are allowed to do in Cologne, you are allowed to do things in Cologne which you are allowed to do in Europe. But you can do it all at home and uh, as people speak about it. Right. Okay, now. Oh, yes, sir. Now, just a little um, addition to what you just said, you are allowed to do. Um, I also like in this kind of dual opposition of Germany and France, which is always on our books. In Italy, at the Rice Studio in '55, Barry was just composing music, and he used whatever he needed That's to make it beat. Yeah. He was outside of this kind of dual opposition. But they also had nine oscillators, and they went to Cologne had one. I mean, they were really well equipped there. They had great stuff and great technicians. Really, really interesting. Nice. That is an interesting message. I keep reading and rereading the first line of that quote. Um, the music is no longer 
primarily conceived as a guide for premeditated emotions. And that, particularly that guide for premeditated emotions bit, feels really quite provocative, and yet I'm not able to quite sort of grasp entirely what is meant by that. And I was wondering how you understand that part of the quote. It seems to draw quite a stark line between the music that proceeds <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and the music that's coming now. And I'm just you know, was interested to hear what you think about that. Well, I mean, I guess it tries to distinguish this kind of approach where, where music has this kind of, you know, logical, logic inside, which is fascinating for a listener to discover while the music is, is proceeding is something else than music, indeed, in which um, some kind of, well, as it says here, premeditated emotions is, is, is um, communicated from a composer to, to, to a listener, to leave that open and to just to say, okay. I mean, the, the quote is, is maybe taken a little bit out of context here because of the few uh, words that are left out because it is particularly also addressing the use of chance operations in uh, the, the, the procedure of, uh, of making these, uh, these pieces. Um, yeah, and I fi also find it a bit difficult to speak on behalf of, uh, of, 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 of someone else, of course. But I'm, I, I just brought this up because I found it a very interesting and inspiring and also, to a certain extent, uh, provoking uh, uh, quote. So. Yeah, no, just because you said it was a, an inspiring quote for you in terms of how you kind of um, use it as a source of yeah. for your own composing. So I was just mm. not to mm. speak on his behalf. Yeah, this is also what I find so important that you, you, yeah. the listener is not listening is not a passive thing. You know, you, 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 you as a listener, uh, especially with this kind of music, you also have a task. You know, you need to do something. You need to discover something in in, in what is uh, presented to you. And uh, yeah, exactly. But that's that's really the difference between um, music that you listen to in the background and again going into the concert hall. Hmm with an open mind and being so dedicated to the listening experience. Right? That's really an active thing to undertake. And it's what a lot of people don't really consider when they think about music. Mm. For instance, they consider music to be a, a form of entertainment, yeah. which, which of course it can be, but for probably most of the people in this room, it's much more important than that. And it, it's not just a uh, something that you listen to is a while away the time or while you're washing the dishes is something that actually changes your life it certainly changed my life getting involved in music and, mm. and very much for the better I think it can change society in very positive ways but only when you're actively engaged in the listening process well I think and entertainment should be defined in some way because I think there are many games uh, out there that would be listed in the entertainment department definitely that will change or have a major effect on lives. Okay. I think uh, I don't see that entertainment is separated from having this impact on lives. Having what? The impact on lives. Like impact. I, I think, for example, Michael Jackson's um, um, text, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they definitely are 
provoking some thought, but still I can listen to my suggestion in an entertaining way. And uh, I don't see the separation there, or, uh, or why to make the separation. Well, let's not let's not let's not um, talk talk about distinctions along the lines of popular versus uh, serious or art music. I wouldn't I wouldn't like to go there at all. But there's surely a distinction between entertainment and art. So, so what is the distinction? It's this it's this thing about being actively involved. Right. If you're, you're, when you're being entertained, you're by definition being passive. And when you're engaging with art, you're by definition being active. Can we go a little bit further on the entertainment? Is it a passive thing? Or because I don't quite go there with you just right now. Well, I think everyone's experienced the entertainment value of film and TV, you know, where at the end of the evening you're tired and you just want to zone out. And so you put on something that's very familiar, soothing, distracting. Yeah, something that you don't want to think about too much because you've been thinking all day. I think most people have experienced entertainment in that form. But the same way, you can't, you wouldn't put on Tarkovsky when you were tired and looking for a distraction because Tarkovsky demands a real investment into the film. So you need active engagement in the film to, to get something out of the experience, I would say. Is, if someone here watches I want to meet you because you're way more intelligent than me. <laughs> question, yeah, and then, and then nobody might. I actually think I, I disagree with that. Um, very good. I, I, I am very good. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested in the film as well. Yeah. And the thing is, of course, sometimes like when you're tired, you're watching, I don't know, you're just watching a sitcom or whatever, something completely harmless, but like even. Even those old uh, crime films from the 60s that are usually seen as uh, popcorn, popcorn film in Germany, I don't know how you popcorn film or did okay. pop it? Popcorn film. Um, like, even those, um, you're often, like, when you're watching Miss Marvel or whatever, you're often like asked to think with the uh, with her who the murderer is, and that's like a form of engagement yeah, sure. in a film that basically is pure entertainment. So I don't think the, uh, think, uh, the distinction of there is as. Well, for, for, for the purpose exactly. of emphasis, I've, I've presented it in a binary format, black and white, and of course it's a continuum. There'll always be people who are working to a sort of brief to be entertaining that sneak some art in there as well. There's no doubt about that. I think that's why you still watch this market, because it has a, a, enough of that to actually keep you engaged. But I think surely the, the general, general principle I'm, I'm making Holds, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I want to say I agree and disagree. Good. In the sense that uh, not having experienced myself, but people give to me saying that video games change their lives. Meaning that there is a way of engaging with um, video games. If we take that example, that makes them go deeper into the experience or literally change the life the way they think. So I think that it's really a question where we put the, the bar which are forming the video games we can consider the form of art because it's creative, it's mm -hmm. intelligent. So I think there was that kind of answer. I would just yeah. comment on that that I disagree and, and, and agree yeah. in the sense that it might be anything that provoking that reaction, that active listening point. Yeah. Uh, far be it for me to say that any particular activity is pure entertainment or another activity is pure art. We all know enough music that can, can tend to be avant-garde, but the art music, which is just repeating the structures already established mm -hmm. and isn't really new at all, it's really quite boring. We all know lots of popular music forms, for instance, that uh, were commercially successful, but of, of, of great artistic value. But it depends, of course, also on the uh, on the um, uh, on, on on how well you are informed about what is presented to you. Because there are many people. I mean, the majority of uh, people who go to a Beethoven symphony performance are there to be entertained. Whereas you can have uh, 
completely different perspective on that music and then be yeah. oh I can I can put it back if yeah. you want as musical language as long as it's a language we have to engage in your talk what is interesting about this quote is that it's a topology because he explains music is and then get up as musical language so what does it mean music I have to understand music not to know what musical language but language means engagement and this has different forms different Yeah. And so the key question is, it there? is yeah. the game can change the life, but it's because of the musical language, it's because of the musical attachment, is there something very strong about the music which takes a part of this change, or is the music just an accessory and the change what you're talking about comes from other parameters, hmm. visual components or whatever. Yeah. Ma Marco, so um, I just wanted to say um, to your question, Colin, uh, I think what Curly uh, meant with premeditated emotions is also the manipulation which is possible in, uh, and which was, as Dirk this morning pointed out, uh, misused or how can you say that in English? Yeah, yeah, misused, yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Manipulation of uh, masses and uh, through the radio and uh, through certain kind of entertainment also. And I think it's a question of conscience not so much, uh, in my point of view, about entertainment or serious music, but about the consciousness of the listener. And um, it's different if you, look, if you watch a Hitchcock film with uh, sociological questions, or just to uh, kind of be passive. And even receiving the message without doing anything can be a conscious act. A conscious act. But um, I think it's part, the point is the consciousness And of course, as electronic music so often is uh, not, I mean, it's just power on. Seems on instrumentalists, you know. That's all you think we do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There is um, an image that this would be um, less alive or less um, different versions of, and so on. So it seems less alive, and, uh, and, and Kirby also tries to say, no, it is alive. Yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, totally agree with Gary. Because I think it's highly individual. Uh, with all the things we know in advance of the um, media we are about to consume and about the questions we bring ourselves. And I think even from a sitcom, you usually would turn on and turn to print off. Like uh, you can go for social uh, questions and uh, look how the characters act and maybe even uh, get educated by that by, by seeing okay so this action provokes this reaction and uh, this is how the group dynamics work or something like that uh, and I think this goes beyond the intent of the creator because I think almost everyone who wants to uh, do uh, like uh, a sitcom is more focused on, okay, I want to get my numbers on it. So many people watch this, and if they're thinking about it, I don't know, maybe it doesn't even matter for me as a creator. Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course, you can analyze any situation from a sociological perspective, whether that's a sitcom or just a scene in a bar. The question to me is how, how open and how rich is the potential experience? How much it is predetermined and only to receive on one level, and how much depth is there to be extracted from it? That would be important to me. I think for me, I could listen to any kind of music, while I'm ironing my shirts or something, but I think there's just certain types of music that I would think is kind of wasteful to lose this chance to really um, listen to it closely. And I think then there comes uh, the personal value you make into the kind of music. Like as you said, you know, when you watch a Hitchcock movie at 9, 1 a.m. or something, because most people would feel like this is a waste of opportunity to not listen to, uh, not see with like the full attention. So um, that's why I think we have like this huge discussion on what, what's entertainment and what's not or what's art, because Um, it's just a personal view of like, how you want to see it at that moment. But it's also, is it not also a personal decision on the part of the creator? 
not just the individual is perceiving it, but an actual decision which you make when you start creating a work of art. So you mean uh, composers don't make music and you don't think it's art? Keyword is communication. So yes. it's also managed. Keyword is communication. I have intent to tell this concept through my music. Mm -hmm. Do you get it? So, this is, I think that's what you, what you meant. The creator decides to do use it for a purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's communication. Is the communication match the, 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 the receiving person or not? Mm -hmm. Anything else cannot reach the language level. If, uh, but also that if you, yeah, I'll continue, but also if you, if you want to create something which has broad appeal as, as entertainment, then you, you choose materials surely, which touch a broad range of people, which a broad range of people can structure. And when things go more in an artistic direction, you've got less of that. You've got more of a challenge. And you're so almost setting yourself up to be misunderstood because it takes so much energy and attention to engage with it. And so it's, it's, it's a matter of level and investment. Um, perhaps one could argue on the, on the question that, like, is, is it the creator, does the creator make a choice? Like, I think that depends whether the creator agrees with the question, or oh, whether the creator agrees that there's a difference between art and entertainment, because there will probably be many creators who don't really sure. think there's a difference, and then they won't make the choice. They'll just try to make both sure. at the same time. True. Sure. Sure. Whether they're aware of it or not, they might still be making that decision. <laughs> Well, I think what you just said, I think that really belongs the question is something or does something has less value just because it's mainstream? Because if you tend to think that like something that is like more available or known to a lot of people, um, how does it change its value? So it is something just mm -hmm. art because there's a elite group that loves to it? No. So no, surely not. But, and, and value is, is, is an important part of this discussion, but it's not something we're touching up the button now. It, it's a huge part of it, but it's a very difficult thing to, to approach. I, uh, I would like you to make it more a, a concrete, uh, like an example, give an example of where is the decision, for example, of, uh, to go more into the uh, entertainment direction and to go more into the art direction? Oh, very simply, uh, in, in, in musical terms, do you have a beat or do you not have a beat? <laughs> Just to be really banal about it. That's one example. But isn't that always an artistic decision? But it can be, it can be a decision which is, is focused on uh, whether you're going to provide entertainment or not. And whether you're going to make money or not. Yeah, but isn't that an artistic decision? It can be an artistic decision, it can also be a commercial decision. It, 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 it's driven by commercial, but yeah, I see it like some kind of a bigger way that uh, the artistic decision lies in, okay, I go the commercial route, or I <laughs> diversify from that and go a different way. I think this is also a kind of art uh, that uh, is important to be uh, there. That's important for the music you're creating. Like so I, I, think, I think it's, it's, it's part of the artistic decision of, of the process of creating art to say, okay, this will be more commercial or this is more uh, entertaining, so I will use this. I think it's, it's, uh, it's an artistic decision, uh, always. I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. I would say what is meant is that pre-mediated emotions, or however you want to call it, that type of manipulation achieve something by the listener. Are you really informing? Information means to give you something new, some new information, or are you just fulfilling an expectation? If you just fulfill an expectation purposely, I would not call it art. But if you're informing, you try to make something from yourself, you are authentic. You have something new to say, which comes just from you. Then it doesn't matter how it's sounds. It can be the speed, it's everything. It comes from your heart, you inform the listener, you bring something new from you. Uh, whatever it is, I would call it art. Yeah. The, uh, the absence or, or presence of a beat is certainly not a determining factor. I just gave you that as an example. But I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. Authenticity and, and intention 
and, and cynicism. Yeah, it's it's definitely money for the bottles. Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, we're okay, kind okay. of yeah, think about. It. We're kind of forming a triangle at the moment, and, and Levin's got something to say at the back of it. Sarah's a part there. Come on, tell us the truth. <laughs> Um, it, is it a, an artistic experience because it has the name Sati attached to it? With certain expectations? Or is it in fact pure entertainment? I think uh, you could also do some other things like uh, if you go to a family show in China, it lasts like a shell company in Central China, it lasts like seven, eight hours, and no one, most of the money, not even the players. Uh, of the energy to keep constantly conscious or aware there. Sometimes the feeling between it is very early, or most of the audience keeps it on point. So it's a mixture between active and passive perception, and that is what makes it so special because it doesn't force the listener to constantly keep this active state. Um, and then there's the other form, which is like um, art, which is so, where there's so little that it's almost impossible to get engaged. Like, um, I think of Titian C, I think it's the, I, I'm not sure what this, uh, what correct notation is named. Uh, it's having this US American performance artist who wants to make like a, a lot of one year performances where little things happen, like for one year it's just a page, or for one year I don't know, he made a uh, photography every one hour, like 24 hours, or then his last piece was like 30 years. He's kind of disappeared, and he's going to say, yeah, I make art that I can show for. And that's, it's not impossible to engage an audience, because there's so little happening. But I think it's still an art, and it could be an art here, even though you can't engage it. I would argue you could engage it, nevertheless. But, you know, that's not the thing. If we're already sort of 15 minutes over the lot of time, maybe we should call it a day there, for, the, for now, <laughs> yeah? Concerts in the one hour at 7.30, two and a half hours. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks, Keith. Thank you, Michael.